Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Diolch yn fawr am dod i'r sgwrs yma bod yma. Um, so I'll be talking about dark skies and wildlife as Richard has excellently introduced me and I'll be handing over to Henry about halfway through. Um, so my name's Danny and I am the dark skies officer for North Wales. Uh, when I talk about dark skies and I tell people I'm a dark skies officer, people are always like, where's the Death Star? Where's Darth Vader? But what I actually do is I work for the Dark Skies Partnership, so that's Project North. Um, I work for Snowdonia National Park. They are a dark sky reserve. They have been since 2015. Um, it was a lot of work for them to get that designation. Um, and it's a world renowned designation. They're one of only 13 in the world and it's something that we're really proud of in the National Park. So part of my job is to look after that. Um, and I'm also working for the areas of outstanding natural beauty. So I work across Brenya Clwyd, a different Verdri, Pentlin and Ynys Môn, uh, Clwyd and Ranger Dee Valley, Clim Peninsula and Anglesey. And I'm working with those AUMBs to reduce light pollution in their areas uh, so we can apply for dark sky designation for those as well. Not many people know that Wales has the highest percentage of protected dark skies of anywhere in the world. Uh, so it's something that we're really keen to keep keep growing. Um, we're almost up to 25% of our skies being protected, which is really good. So an international dark sky reserve is a public or private land of substantial size, uh, possessing an exceptional or distinguished quality of starry nights and nocturnal environment that is specifically protected for its scientific, natural, educational, cultural heritage and or public enjoyment. So this is my job in a nutshell. So the International Dark Sky Association basically do what it says on the tin. They are the International Association. If you want to have a dark sky place, that's who you go to. Um, they are the world leaders um, and part of my job is not only protecting the darkness, so I want to minimise light pollution, I educate people on light pollution and what kind of lights they should be using if they want to protect the night skies, but I also bring in the other, element, the other elements, so we do things like stargazing, uh, we go on bat walks, owl walks, uh, we look at, you know, old historic sites and I see it, their connections to the stars, we basically anything to do with stars and the night, that is my bag. So before we go on to the main part of the talk about wildlife, it's just important for you to understand what a dark sky is. It seems a bit silly at first because obviously the sun goes down and everyone gets a dark sky, but unfortunately not all dark skies are equal. Uh, so our dark skies are areas where the stars are visible to the naked eye, so you don't need a telescope, you don't need any fancy equipment, um, there's lots of places in North Wales where you can just go out and look up and you'll see the Milky Way. <clears throat> uh, little light pollution, so this is really crucial and you're going to hear me talk about light pollution all the time. Um, but this is the main, the main issue that we are trying to tackle. Um, and it's usually in a national park or one of the, one of the designated landscapes. So we've got the AUMBs and we've also got like Elan Valley in South Wales. And um, we've got some dark sky discovery sites. Uh, so we've got like the Cambrian Mountains. Uh, they've got some really good sites down there as well. So in Wales, we're really, really embracing the dark skies. So why are they important? Um, obviously, we're going to focus on wildlife, but some other things that you might be interested in and to bear in mind is that it's really important for our health and well-being as human beings. <clears throat> it's uh, important for the environment when we look at like carbon emissions, uh, wildlife, obviously, culture and heritage. And also there's a big part of it, which is good for tourism and our economy. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit more about light pollution so you can really understand that before we look at how it impacts on our wildlife. Uh, so only 2% of Britain's population receive a truly dark sky. So 98% of us are living under light polluted skies. Um, I found it hard to believe this statistic at first because I grew up on Anglesey. I was really lucky. It's naturally quite dark where I live. Um, so I had no concept about light pollution really until I moved to South Wales to go to university and I was horrified at all the, all the light pollution there. So these are light pollution maps. So if you type in light pollution map to Google, this is likely what will come up. They're really accessible, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is taken from satellite data and, and it shows us all the light pollution across Europe, obviously. So we've got the really bright white and red areas here. Uh, they are really, really bad for light pollution and you can see 
the whole of Europe pretty much is, is encompassed by light pollution. It's such a big issue. It's growing 6% year on year around the world. Um, but we are starting to realise that what we're doing with light and people are starting to put things in motion. Countries are really starting to try and get a grip on it. Um, you can see not only are we affecting the land, but if you look at the coasts, we've got a lot of light pollution bleeding out into the coasts. Um, you can clearly see our shipping channels like Dublin to Holyhead there, the English Channel. Um, and it took me a while to figure out what these were in the North Sea, but they're actually oil rigs and the flare from oil rigs send up a hell of a lot of light pollution. <clears throat> if we zoom in to Wales, you can actually see that we are defined by our darkness. I know they say that Wales is stuck in the dark ages, but it's not always a bad thing and it certainly isn't in this case. So you can see Snowdonia, if my mouse comes back there. Um, you can see the Clydean Range and Dee Valley is very dark in the southern, the southern end. Um, the Shin Peninsula is so dark on its northern edge, you can't even see the end of it, um, which is really good. And um, we've got Ennismorn there. Unfortunately for Ennismorn, we have got an RAF base uh, and a port on the end, which reminds me, if you hear jets, I live next to the runway. <laughs> so there's not, oh, there's not a world war breaking out, it's just jets. Um, but you can see if anybody in these cities wants to come over to see dark skies, they've got to come, they've got to come to Wales, really. We are the closest place for them. So we're just making sure that that light pollution isn't growing anywhere and that we're keeping keeping on top of it. So this is what light pollution looks like. So this is a city in America, but it was the best, uh, it was the best example that I could find. Um, on a photo. So we do have cities like this uh, in Britain that are throwing up this much light pollution. So if you can imagine living there, you are never going to see the stars. You are never going to see, um, you know, you're never going to get a good night's sleep because there's always there's always light around. Uh, this is known as sky glow. Uh, so this is all wasted energy that's being sent up into the atmosphere and it's just unnecessary. It's also known as Alan. So it's known as artificial light at night. So I'm really sorry if you're called Alan. Your name has been taken <laughs> to be used for light pollution. So this is what it could look like. So dark skies doesn't mean no light. So it's really important in this project that we emphasize that message. I'm not going to come around like the blitz. I'm not going to turn your lights out. I'm not going to force you to, you know, paint your windows black or anything like that. Um, so this is Tucson in Arizona, which is the home of the International Dark Sky Association. So as you can imagine, they're really hot on their good lighting practice. So you can see all the lights here are downward facing, but there's absolutely no absence of light where it is needed. So the junctions are all really lit up, the pavements are lit up. You can see where you need to go. <clears throat> the only one that I can see is this little floodlight in the middle there, which must really annoy them. But um, you can see there's absolutely no upward light there at all. So just goes to show it doesn't mean no light. So I'm going to just show you this map again because I want you to think about this map now in terms of habitat. So when we look at these light pollution maps, um, we see all this light everywhere, especially like in the cities. Um, think about how much habitat is being lit up here. We have completely just been eroding habitat with light without even thinking about it. We don't think twice about putting lights in our garden or putting an external light up. And obviously people haven't been doing this because they want to harm wildlife or they want to get rid of habitat, but we've just been so clueless about what we've been doing. Um, and light pollution is actually the least understood form of pollution. So we're quite good at air pollution. We know about water pollution, plastic pollution, things like that. But when it comes to lighting, we've just been <clears throat> on a rampage, shoving light everywhere. Um, and now our wildlife is sadly paying the price. So more than 60% of our biodiversity depends on a dark sky. And in fact, it's actually a much higher number than that because this is only the species that we've tested and we haven't got around to testing all the species. Um, so it's likely to be much higher. <clears throat> so it has a huge negative impact on our on our wildlife. Uh, lighting up habitat removes habitat. It makes it unsuitable for a lot of species. A lot of our wildlife is nocturnal um, and they have evolved to hunt at night um, and find their way around at night. So by putting light into those places, we're stopping areas that they can hunt. We're making some species more easily predatable um, and just having a really bad effect on them. It's particularly bad for our migratory birds, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and it causes untold damage to our ecosystem, which we're only just starting to appreciate. So the first species I'm going to talk about is quite an obvious one. So we're going to talk about our bats. 
months. Bats have had a really bad run of it in the last year, so I'm going to give them a bit of love because I love bats. Uh, but the UK is home to 18 bat species. Um, but it's really important that if you do, if you are interested in bats and you want to see bats, uh, every species and their breeding grounds, resting places, they're all protected by law. So don't go disturbing any bats or uh, you'll go to prison. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you want to observe bats, they make their habitat in lots of different, lots of different places. So in woodlands, wetlands, farms and even urban areas, which people are sometimes quite surprised about. Um, in Wales, we we are really lucky, and we've got some really uncommon uncommon bats, some really rare bats like the uh, lesser horseshoe. Um, we've got lots of pipistrels. I've got pipistrels in my roof, <laughs> which I'm very happy with. Um, but they can be found, yeah, even in new builds. And property developers absolutely hate them because obviously you've got to have a bat survey. But bats are so important uh, to our ecology. Uh, they are a they're a really good species for it. They're an indicator species. So we know if something's happening to our bat populations, something's going wrong in the food chain, something's going wrong there. So we need to stop it. So they're one of the indicators that the government are using uh, in their fight to halt biodiversity loss. So they're really monitoring the numbers of, of bats. Uh, we're, like I said, we're really lucky in North Wales. We've got lots of areas where they're quite abundant. Um, one of the best places is Nantapandi or the Dingle in Changavni, which you, you wouldn't think because it's it's a nature reserve, but it is in quite an urban area. But we've actually got eight species of bat in the Dingle, um, including the dog bulletins, which I can never see, um, and the, the lesser horseshoe, greater horseshoe. Um, we do bat walks there in normal normal times. Um, and there's also Gwaith Powder and Penry and Daedrith. The North Wales Wildlife Trust do walks there. And I know that they do loads of really good uh, bat walks. Um, the best time to see them is the summer months uh, between dusk and dawn because they're quite crepuscular. So what bats do is they light sample. So if you know where bats live, it's really good to just sit back and watch them as the, as the sun starts to go down because you'll see them, they'll come out a little bit, have a look around, see if the light's okay, and they will just retreat if it's not quite right. And then when conditions are right, they will come out and you'll see them start to start to hunt. Uh, they love hedgerows. Um, when we talk about like back, back corridors, people plant hedgerows, so they've got a uh, They've got connect, connect, have connectivity between habitats when they're hunting. Um, and I just I just love to watch them in the night, in the summer. As the sun goes down, you see the swallows and the swift and they gradually just change into the bats uh, where I am, which is they're really good to watch. Um, I would if you want to see them and you want to go with an expert, uh, the Gwynedd Bat Group are excellent. They do really good events. They're a really friendly group as well. Um, they've got so much knowledge. So it's, they're definitely a good one to go with. Um, the North Wales Wildlife Trust, who I've already mentioned, they do really good bat walks. Um, and if you really want to get into it, you can get one of these little things on here. So this is an echo meter. This is a, a really fancy one. This is the one I have. Um, and it's an echo meter. So it, you, it picks up on the bat's echo location. So bats have evolved to be really good pred predators at night. They're not blind. I know people say they're saying blind as a bat, but they've actually got quite good eyesight. But they have developed and evolved over time to use darkness to become really good predators. And um, this works for them as well because the darkness makes them harder to be predated. Uh, so that's why they've evolved that way. They're our only flying mammal as well, our only true flying mammal. So if you get one of these echo meters, they are really small. It's only like this big. It plugs into the bottom of your phone and it turns it into a, a bat locator, essentially. And it will bring up the echo location as sound waves on your phone. You can click on them and it will tell you exactly what species of bat is there and it will show you their flight path. And I, I just think it's really cool. But I am a bit of a bat nerd, so maybe you're not as interested as I am, but I think they're pretty cool. So if you want to help bats, wildlife gardening is one of the best ways to help them. And um, so plant lots of like wildflowers, things that are good for pollinators because you want to attract the insects. If you attract the insects, then the bats are going to come. And um, so they particularly like honeysuckle, honey, wild honeysuckle is night flowering as well. So it attracts all the insects in the night, the night pollinators. So they love that. And you do find that quite a lot in the wild hedgerows. Uh, so they, they love that. Lavender. Um, you know, basically any anything that's good for for insects. You can build a bat box and put those up. So they're just like bird boxes, just a little bit different. They've got a small entrance on the bottom um, instead of like a hole in the side. 
be considerate with your light usage. That is the most important thing that we can do for our bats. We just haven't realised that we have been eroding their habitat and their hunting grounds with light. So I've seen really bad light installations where, um, like I said earlier, where bats need to light sample, they've shone light onto bat roosts, onto their entrances, and sadly that's entombed bats inside those, those roosts, so they can't leave the building. Um, and, you know, bats can really suffer that way. They can die. Uh, they all sadly just starve, which is really, really horrible. I'm not saying people did that on purpose, uh, but just be aware of what is what is around you when you are putting up external lighting. Um, some bats aren't light shy, so some species take advantage of the light. Um, because it attracts insects, they will be found hunting under street lights. Uh, you do see that more in urban areas where their more natural habitat has been taken away. But as I mentioned earlier, that then leaves them open to predated. And there's actually records of urban bats being predated by peregrines. Um, so, you know, there's everything they try and adapt to, there is added risks to it. So these two photos at the bottom are communities who've considered bat corridors with their lighting. So they've used red light, which doesn't seem to impact on them at all. Um, so this one is in Herefordshire and they've just used a red light where they know the bats are. Um, and this one is in Europe, I think it was in Holland, and they've put the light really low to the ground so that the bats can fly over the lights because they're not going to be flying that low to the ground. Um, so it's just two quite inventive ways of where they've they've you know thought about their bats and helped. I know in Pembrokeshire they're thinking about making these kind of bat corridors. Um, so they've already done like bee friendly corridors. So now they're going that next step for the for the bats as well. So there are lots of things that we can do for our bats. <clears throat> The next species I'm going to talk about is uh, one of our migratory birds and it's the European nightjar and I just think they're really weird birds and they look really cool. <laughs> they're so they're really really good at uh, camouflage but what makes them interesting when it comes to light pollution um, is it's one of the first times that it's been scientifically proven that an animal's migratory patterns uh, are associated with the lunar cycle so it's been absolutely proven that they use lunar cues and they synchronize that, their migration, their breeding um, all with all with the lunar patterns. So you can imagine for a night jar, if you shove light up everywhere, it's not going to get those natural light cues from the moon and it's always going to think it's a full moon. So that has an effect on lots of our bird species, but we're just quite behind in the science. So it's just having that science there to back it up. But this is one of the first species that's been proven that it is having a detrimental effect. Um, the night jar, uh, they like more more in heathland. Uh, they particularly favour uh, like commercial woodlands, so plantations that have got lots of different stages of tree. Um, you can find them in Coidlandegla Forest in Denbyshire, so the Coidian Range and Dee Valley. Over June, July, uh, they will do nightjar work walks with their ranges, and they they are really good. I lo I love those walks. Um, if you want to see them. June and July are on warm still evenings as the sun starts to set. They really like those like warm muggy nights. Um, it's unlikely that you'll see them because like I said, they are so good at camouflaging. Um, but they are, they are just, yeah, you have to listen, use your ears and you'll hear that distinctive cheering call. I wish I could play it for you, but Zoom doesn't seem to like videos. Um, but it's quite interesting, the night jar over the myth. We've got quite a lot of mythology associated to our nocturnal species because as humans, we evolved to be very scared of the night because there was things out there that could eat us. So basically anything that makes a noise in the night has driven a fear instinct into us. And the night jar was no different. Um, so in mythology, the night, jar, the night jar was a harbinger of doom. People thought it was witches, that cheering call. They thought it was witches cackling in the bushes and that the witches were gonna come, come and get them. But one of my favorite facts is that the European name, which is just at the top there, actually means goat sucker. I've got to be careful. I don't, mis <laughs> no, don't mispronounce it that. Because uh, for the longest time, rural communities thought that night jars were stealing milk from their goats and their cows. Uh, they also used to think that of hedgehogs. Um, so unfortunately, night jars and hedgehogs were really heavily persecuted. Um, and Henry VIII in particular really hated hedgehogs. And he just, he killed loads, loads of them. Um, so yeah, it just goes to show that we've always had this, this fear of things that we don't know in the night. And we put these ridiculous, ridiculous things on them. Um, yeah, so that's one of my favourite facts about the nightjar. So the next species is our sort of amphibians, our frogs and our toads. 
So studies have proven that light pollution is so damaging that toads subjected to constant light pollution had their growth stunted by 15%. And that was at least at least 15%. Um, and it stopped frogs laying eggs altogether. That was an American study, but it was used on, it, they did test on species that are found in the UK, like the common toad and the common frog. Um, and that was really horrifying that we are, you know, we're stopping frogs being able to go for their natural cycle at all. Um, frogs and toads are a little, they're a little bit different from, from each other in where they, where they live and how they, how they act, but they all like water. <laughs> so this time of year now, I've actually saw my first frog about, Oh, it was a toad actually two days ago, three days ago, um, because their migration is starting now. They're starting to come out of hibernation and they need to find their way back to the ponds and pools where they were spawned. So that's when we get like the march of the toads. And where I live, I love it because it gets absolutely covered. You cannot go anywhere because there's just frogs and toads everywhere. Um, so I spend a lot of my time picking them up, putting them in buckets and moving them <laughs> to the other side of the road. Uh, so you want to, if you want to see them, um, now is the perfect time to be going out. You need a temperature over five degrees on those damp evenings. So, you know, those cloudy evenings when it's not really like torrential rain, but there's a cloud and you're like in a cloud and it's not really raining, but you're soaked through. Frogs love that kind of weather. So do the toads. And that's when you'll, you'll see the most. Um, the best thing you can do to see them is just go out in the evening, like we've just said, or join a toad patrol. Um, I've just started my own toad patrol um, and there's loads of them. So if you go on the Frog Life website, these are basically volunteer teams who will go to areas where they know there's a lot of toads and a lot of frogs and they will don hive his jackets like a little toad army and they'll get buckets and they'll pick up the toads on one side and pass them over to the other side of the road. Um, because it's, it is a huge issue. Uh, we are losing so many frogs and toads on our roads every year. But these are some of the locations of tow patrols in North Wales. So we've got one in Pentir, Newbra. There's actually two in Newbra. So you've got Newbra and you've got Shin Park Glass because there's a lot of water in that area. So there's loads of uh, amphibians there. Shanrig, Morvanevin on the Shin Peninsula and Bodvari in Denbyshire. Um, so there's loads of them. And if you want to start your own tow patrol, if you know there's an area, you can sign up on there as well. So there's 20 tons of toads killed every year on UK roads, which is so devastating. And I'm sure we've all seen it when we've been driving around the sadly seen squish toads and frogs on the roads. Um, but one of the reasons that they get drawn to the roads is, yes, they've got to migrate. And a lot of the time roads are in the way, but most of our roads are lined by streetlights. And it seems that toads and frogs are really, really attracted to light. So if you've got lights around your pond in the garden, you might find you get lots of frogs and toads and in that instance that works for them because they're finding water it might not be the water where they need to get to um but it is it is a form of habitat but unfortunately when it comes to the roads they get attracted to these street lights and they don't seem to want to move on and um, so that's why so many of them do sadly get killed on the roads so join a tow patrol is my uh, my moral there so one of the other things I'm going to talk about is insects and insects. They're not very sexy. People don't really care about them, but they are hugely important. They're crucial to us as a species. Um, without our insects, we are going to be wiped out. So light pollution is a key bringer of the insect apocalypse. So I don't know if you've heard about the insect apocalypse, but that's something that's really worrying scientists at the moment. We are losing insects like nobody's business. Um, in some nature reserves in Europe, they've seen a decrease of insect species of 75% over the last 30 years. Huge, huge declines in all, all different species. Um, so one I'm going to talk about is moths. Again, moths, they're not very cool. People don't think they're cool, but I think they're cool. They are night butterflies. <laughs> um, there's 2,500 different species of moths. And when you compare that to 58 butterfly species, Moths are way cooler. There's so much variety. They've got amazing names um, and they're not all dull and dusty. There's some that are really brightly coloured, as you can see in those photos in the bottom. Some of them are masses of camouflage. Um, they're just they're just ace. I really like moths. Um, so most of them are night flying, but there are 100 day flying species. So when you compare that to butterflies, there's still more day flying species than there are of butterflies. But we haven't really paid a lot of attention to moths. As, as a nation. We do have some really good experts in, in North Wales. Um, so 
as Richard was saying, there's the bio blitz. Uh, that's a really good way to find moths in your own backyard. Um, they can be found year round. So we've got the winter moth is quite abundant at the moment. Um, and that is the species name. It's not just winter moths, it's with the winter moth. Um, and you can find them everywhere. Uh, so it doesn't matter where you live, there will be moths. The best time to see them is by searching flowering plants one or two hours after dusk. So you can just get a torch, go and have a little route around in the hedges um, and you will you will find some more likely than not or join a moth trapping session. So those happen all over North Wales. There are some people who uh, are specialists. Um, I'm sure that Richard and the team at Covnord have got a lot, a lot of contacts when it comes to this. Um, but yeah, they're just they're just a really they're a really interesting species. They're much more interesting than we than we give them credit for. Um, so they have amazing names. Um, so we've got ones like the Death's Head Hawk Moth, and that's got a skull on it. That one is a really rare one. Um, we've got the Mother Shipton Moth. This is the one in the top corner here. And apparently, the pattern on the wing looks like Mother Shipton. I beg to differ, but there we go. I don't know what the Victorians were seeing half the time. Um, but we've got some really interesting ones. So like the Death's Head Hawk Moth, uh, for example, the one that I was just talking about, um, they can actually emit a really high pitched noise that makes them sound like the queen bee. So they use that as a disguise and they can basically infiltrate hives and steal the honey, which is really clever. Um, and there's, there's just basically masses of disguise. And unfortunately for the moth, they are very tasty so almost everything eats them <laughs> so <laughs> hedgehogs toads bats uh pretty much anything that comes out at night will eat a moth um so light pollution is responsible for the deaths of 100 billion insects each summer in germany alone and sadly moths are one of those victims so we've all seen moths attracted like a moth to a flame they'll gather around the light bulb and unfortunately that can that can kill them they can get burnt um, but it's the same with light pollution. They will flock to streetlights, which makes them easier to be predated by some species that will take advantage of it. But equally, it removes them from where they should be. So they're not doing their night pollination. They're really important for night pollination of lots of species, which a lot of people don't realise. We focus on things like bees uh, and other insects in the day, but they do a proper good shift overnight while we're all asleep. Um, things like blue tits are completely uh they they need moths they only eat well the broods pretty much only eat the winter moth caterpillar uh, and each brood of blue tit needs about fifteen thousand caterpillars so that is a lot of caterpillars that they need to eat so if we start to lose our moths that's going to start to have a, a a bad effect a domino effect on the rest of our of our ecosystems um so yeah, next time you see a moth being fluttering around around your house, don't get annoyed at it. It's only uh, it's only trying to do its job. Um, interestingly, locally, one of the insects that we've seen a really big decline in is glowworms. Um, for example, my dad's in his sixties, which you will shout at me for telling people, uh, but he can remember seeing the hedgerows full of glowworms. Um, and I'm thirty, and I've only ever seen one glowworm in my life, which is really quite sad. Um, but one of the main reasons for that is light pollution. So the way glowworms work is that the female glows, she doesn't fly, and the male will fly over trying to find that light of the female. And what we've done with street lights is essentially made massive, big glowworm, male, male glowworm attractors. And on the Great Ulm, there was a woman on her holidays and she was a glowworm specialist and she'd gone to the Great Ulm because it's one of the uh, biggest colonies that was around at the time. So she knew she'd see them there. And so, sadly for her, she found loads of dead male uh, glowworms at the bottom of the street lights. So fortunately, because she was an expert, she took note, she told someone and they changed the lights, but they almost wiped out their colony in the, in the course of two weeks. Um, and now it is starting to recover, but it is one of the best places you can go to see uh, glowworms if you want to go. Uh, again, I think North Wales Wildlife Trust, I think they do a glowworm walk. Uh, we do it as well um, in various areas. So. The last species that I'm going to talk about is the Manx shearwater. Uh, this is one of our migratory birds and it's one of the ones that is worst affected by light pollution. So Manx shearwater are brilliant, they're brilliant birds. When you see them flying um, in the sea and in the water, that's what they're built for. You know, they are really elegant out at sea. But if you see them on land, 
um, they, their legs are too far back in their body and they're just really clumsy and really slow. So you won't ever find them on the mainland. They've evolved to land, uh, to live on islands around the UK um, when they're here. And that's so they don't get predated. They also live in burrows under the ground. That's another reason so that they can't get, uh, they don't get predated. And they only fly into land over the under the cover of darkness. Um, a Manx shearwater over their lifetime can fly the equivalent miles of traveling to the moon and back 10 times. Um, and they can live up to 30. But I think there was a, I think there was a 50 year old one found on Ennis Enchi. I could be wrong, but I think that there was. Uh, so they do a lot of miles over their time um so they only habitat hab they only uh live on offshore islands so Enchi, skoma ramsey um wales is actually a stronghold of the manx shearwater and 50 percent of the world's population is at skoma it's the largest colony of anywhere in the world and they have 350,000 pairs there um, and when the migration starts and when they come here to breed in March, I've never personally seen it, but apparently the noise is phenomenal. And if you stand there at night as they're all coming into land, it's apparently one of the best sites, sites you can you can see in the natural world. And it's something I am going to try and do when we if we ever get out of lockdowns. Um, the best way to see them is by you know going on the sea. So we use, go on a boat trip when we're allowed to do these things um, and see them when they're at their best fishing along along the coasts. Um, March to July is when they're doing their migration, so when they're coming here to breed. Uh, so they will lay their eggs in the burrows under the ground and they'll fatten the chicks up underground. And then the parents leave under cover of darkness again and leave the chicks to fend for themselves. So they're pretty much on their own um, from the minute they fledge. So they wait for a new moon when there's no moon in the sky. So again, that they're associated to, they, um, they use the lunar cycle uh, in their migration. They will come up from underground and the way they've evolved is that when we didn't have any light pollution, so for thousands of years when we've had no light, uh, the horizon has a natural glow to it. So that's what they're looking for. Uh, so under the cover of darkness, they'll come out of their burrows, they'll spread their wings and they'll try and find this natural glow. But obviously as humans, what we have done is especially on the coast, we've lit up our coasts. Uh, so they're getting attracted and disorientated and being brought inland and they've been found as far inland as Birmingham, where they've collided with buildings um, and people have had to basically box them up and ship them back over to the islands to be released again. Um, and that, that's if they survive because they need that migration is so crucial for them, that first one. They've got 7,000 miles to cover in their first migration. They go all the way to Argentina and they don't touch land for the first two years of their life. So they need those energy stores that as they've been fattened up as a chick, that's what they're living off for those first two years. So any time that is lost, being distracted and being disorientated, it can be absolutely devastating for them. So one of the things that we are working with the RSPB on this year hopefully is a campaign to ask people who live on the coast to be more considerate with their light usage especially at fledging time for the manx shearwater because it is having a really bad effect on them um one of the worst areas for it actually is pembrokeshire because they've got the petrochemical plants there and they they are seeing it have a really devastating impact on their uh, on their shearwater down there so i'm going to talk to you a little about, bit about ennis Enchi. Bardsey Island and the lighthouse there. So this is a photo I took, not showing off. I was allowed there because it was in between the two uh, two lockdowns. This is just a single shot, so I haven't edited this at all. So this is how the Milky Way appears to the naked eye. Um, and this is the lighthouse. And you might notice that the lighthouse has a red light, but it didn't always have a red light. And, and even though it's so dark here, it's stuck out into the into the sea. They haven't got any external lights on the island. You can still see there is some light pollution there. And that's actually Dublin lighting up the sky from 60 miles away. So it shows you, you don't have to have light pollution in your area. Light pollution has no boundaries. It basically, you can see it for miles and miles around. <clears throat> so when it was a white light on that lighthouse, they had a really big issue with bird attractions and fatal bird attractions. Uh, so there was a lot of birds killed at Bardi because they were flocking around the lighthouse because it was distracting them from their natural migration. And they were seeing thousands of birds die every year. Um, you can see 
These were given to me by Hugh Miles, who was, who was a warden on the island in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and this was some of the work that he was really interested in. So I'm really grateful for him for sharing these with us. Um, but you can see where the light was increased in power and you can see how the number of casualties jumps up. Um, so we're looking at nearly 2000 casualties uh, in one year, uh, which is which is crazy. And you can see this is per month, casualties per month. And over the migratory months, that's when they were seeing more birds get attracted to the lighthouse. Um, and it's also affected by the moon. So most birds uh, need those natural moon cues. So when they knew that, you know, instinctively, they knew that the moon was going to be there. They were mistaking the lighthouse for a, a giant moon, essentially. It was confusing them. They were flocking around the lighthouse, becoming exhausted, collapsing and dying. So I'm going to show you some distressing images now. So if you've got children watching, they might you might not want them to see this, um, but they, it, is, it does show some dead animals. So just a, just a quick warning. Um, so this is another photo by Hugh. Uh, this is the lighthouse, and you can see the beams of light and how many birds are attracted into the into those beams, um, which is really it's really quite distressing to see when you think that all those birds are in a state of confusion. A lot of them were flying into the lighthouse and unfortunately dying. Um, and in one night, the worst night, Hugh said that he collected 700 dead birds in one night. Um, these were a lot of thrush species, uh, red wing, starlings, you know, birds that were birds that were migrating huge distances and they were so close to getting to their final destination only to be lost at the lighthouse. Um, so Hugh talks about it as being really, really distressing, as you can imagine, and he's, his job was just to collect, collect all these birds and sadly just you know, it's such a loss. But this is it is a good news story because they were losing all these birds all the time. And as you as you saw in that original photo, the lighthouse has now got a red light. And basically that was installed in 2014. And overnight it stopped it stopped the fatal attractions of the birds. So they've had no fatal attractions since the lighthouse was changed in 2014, which begs begs the question why we've got so many lighthouses with white lights around the UK and why nobody seems to be picking this up as an issue because that was one lighthouse you know they lost 40,000 red wing over the course of a few years so if that's happening times how many lighthouses we've got around the UK you know it's quite a worry so you know it just goes to show how you know a simple solution like a red light the lighthouse is still doing its job everyone is still safe um, but we just don't seem to be putting it into action, sadly. <clears throat> so the last thing, the last project is the Alice project. So we've got Alan, which is artificial light at night. And we've now got Alice as well, who is artificial light in coastal environments. And um, I'm just letting you know about this one because it's a local one done by Bangor University. And um, it's only about they've only been doing it for the last year or so. Um, and they found that artificial light from coastal towns and cities can now be detected above 22% of the world's coast nightly. These areas are set to grow even further as coastal human population centres are set to double by 2060 because everyone wants to see view. Um, we know that many coastal marine creatures are highly sensitive to light and have adapted to use cycles of moonlight to inform various aspects of their life history. And um, what this project has gone on to find is that light pollution is affecting is affecting life even at the very bottom of the seabed. So not only are we impacting on our birds and mammals that live on the land, we're also having a terrible consequences on insect, uh, on a zoological life that lives in the water, our mammals. Um, and we just, this is the first real study into that. So we just haven't understood it. So this is a project to keep an eye on. because I'm sure we're gonna find lots of really interesting things over the coming years. So, <clears throat> This is just a statistic about uh, how much light is wasted in the in the US. So this isn't globally. This is just the US. It costs one point five billion dollars and 12 million tons of carbon. And that is wasted just on external light. So 30 percent of the power generated in America goes on external lighting. And when we've just been talking about what we have been on lighting up habitat, this is an amazing tree. Yeah, it looks really pretty with the lights on, but how much more valuable was that tree when it was a habitat and not being lit up? Um, trees also are not immune to light pollution. So since the 1940s, we've understood that trees have, uh, have been impacted by light pollution. Um, and in fact, 
most of our trees are uh, on a 24 hour light cycle. So they they do certain things at certain times of the day, depending on those natural light cues that they're getting. Um, and the time that they're exposed to the light can influence their leaf shape, their pigmentation, leaf formation, autumn drop time, root development, um, onset of buds breaking and dormancy. And dormancy and autumn drop time is one of the really crucial things that trees need to have that shortening of day as winter's approaching because they know they need to start becoming dormant. Uh, trees that don't become dormant over winter that need to and don't drop their leaves, they're sadly going to die over winter or suffer uh, and become become sick trees. Um, and there's places in America where they have they have avenues where street lights have been put out along tree lined avenues. Um, and they found that trees that were exposed to light when bad weather came, those trees were 50% more likely to fall in a storm. And um, so it just goes to show that we're having an impact on all, all aspects of life and we just we just haven't really realised. So I'm now going to pass over to Henry, which I'm sure many of you are happy about. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing Henry. And then I will come back in a bit when you're done just to finish off. All right. Thanks for that, Danny. That was really interesting. And, uh, you know, when you dig down into it, the effect of light is uh, very pervasive. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Right. Everyone see that? Great. Yeah, so I'm Henry Cook and I work for the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, thanks to Richard uh, to Cofnod for inviting me to speak today. And thanks to all of you for uh, listening. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, camera traps and their use for nocturnal wildlife recording. You may have um, had some experience yourselves or not. If you've not, then um, there'll be lots of new information in here for you. Hopefully there's also some uh, useful tips and information for people who have used camera traps before. But um, I'm going to talk about um, the development of camera traps, uh, setting them, and uh, give you some examples of uh, data we've recorded uh, with camera traps from right around North Wales. So uh, some of the more interesting findings. Um, camera traps, also known as trail cameras, um, and this, uh, that name sort of has developed from their use as a, a tool for hunters, and it's one of the original uh, reasons they were developed um, 30 years ago. Uh, recent years have seen a big increase in popularity though, and that has come as the, as the price has fallen, but also the range of products has grown to suit every, uh, every type of user. Camera traps are passive recorders, so um, you put them up and they record wildlife without you needing to be there. Uh, one of the big advantages of that, of course, is uh, nocturnal wildlife is very shy and we're often not out there at the right times of day to record it. So this is a really useful tool in our inventory for monitoring wildlife. Uh, they work in the day and at night, uh, thanks to um, infrared uh, beams. Um, they can get pretty good images of wildlife at night, and this is one of their greatest uses. So the benefits of camera traps. Uh, why are they good? Um, and why do we use them so much? Well, they, they generate verifiable data. So the images that are produced can be uh, passed on to um, recording bodies, such as cough for verification. Um, this way we make sure the data is of a high standard. Um, and they generate far more data than in-person recording. I've already touched upon that. Um, but were we to use um, things like cameras that would require lights, as Danny has shown, that would affect some wildlife and we wouldn't record them. Um, it doesn't disturb the wildlife compared to in-person monitoring, such as live trapping. Um, so if you were to set a, uh, a pitfall trap, say for um, uh, mammals and things, small mammals, then you'd have to go and collect that. They've lost out time in terms of feeding and uh, 
carrying on their uh, their lives. So it's um, it's a, a passive recording method. Uh, it's also a useful method for monitoring behaviour. Um, so um, on like scientific studies or if there's concerns about um, issues affecting certain species, uh, it's a useful technique for that. And uh, I've given, uh, I've put a picture up on the right here of um, the tern colony at Kemlin Lagoon on Anglesey. And the North Wales Wildlife Trust now use trail cameras routinely on the islands um, as a monitoring tool for um, predation issues. Uh, you may remember a few years ago that uh, the whole colony got up and deserted um, and this was thought to be due to otters, although I'm not sure we had camera traps out at the time, but there were anecdotal sightings uh, quite frequently of otter and lots of field signs. And camera traps have been a big boost to nocturnal recording. So um, before that, um, certain species would have to be, would have to use other methods to detect them. Um, so, and quite often with mammals, that might mean uh, things like roadkill. And things like roadkill still make up a quite a big proportion of mammal records. But uh, the potential for camera traps to collect records of animals uh, undergoing their normal routine is, is really great. So camera traps are mostly used by researchers, conservationists and increasingly hobbyists. Um, that's as their, their price has fallen and their ease of use has increased um, uh, dramatically. It can be used as a general recording tool just to see what's around the range of species you might have. Um, but they could be used more formally as a monitoring tool for conservation so we can deploy them routinely and um, use that as a, a, a method to see the range of species present, but also um, how frequently they're recorded and maybe even how, um, uh, how many individuals are in a population. Um, so as I mentioned, they're useful for species richness monitoring but they're particularly good at capturing rare and shy species. And this is because they're out potentially for weeks on end and um, they may just capture one sighting of a species, a uh, rare mammal, for example, um, such as an otter uh, or a polecat or something and uh, that, that you would just wouldn't get if you were present yourself and hoping for a sighting. Um, they're useful for recording disturbance and predation. Um, I previously showed you the turn slide, um, but also um, here the picture on the right, uh, this is of a barn owl that was captured by a camera trap on a feeding station um, in the dunes at Gronobs. Um, this is put up as part of the little turn project that I used to work with. And uh, we use this as a method to record what was coming to take food from the feeding station and uh, we weren't expecting a bar now. It didn't actually take anything on this occasion, but um, we didn't even know there was barn owls around. So uh, that just goes to show the, the value of recording uh, rare and shy species. So I'm gonna talk a bit about how camera traps work. Um, they're, uh, they're made up of several uh, interesting um, developments that all come together um, to provide the pictures that I've been showing so far. They are waterproof, um, they have housing that's designed to keep um, moisture and humidity out, although that doesn't always work 100%, but the newer, the newer ones tend to be very good at that. Uh, they use batteries, so we don't need to have a um, a mains power source, this enables the traps to go up in very remote locations. Um, they contain a digital camera to collect the um, pictures. And these pictures are collected by uh, the triggering of a sensor that detects uh, motion. Um, so if it was recording constantly, you'd fill up a memory card very quickly. Whereas this can adapt it to only taking photos when wildlife is present. Although depending on where you set it, you may get things like swaying branches and grass triggering the camera quite often. 
Um, so that it works at night, they contain infrared beams. Um, this gives you sort of black and white images, but still good enough for recording in most circumstances. And some of the more expensive models even have inbuilt Wi-Fi and other features, um, sort of as such as pre-recording uh, the motion uh, of an animal. So let's say an animal quickly runs past and you want a nice video from it. <clears throat> um, if you missed a few seconds before, it can look like a very rushed video. So the, some of the more fancy models can pre-record uh, part of the uh, footage for you. So um, the types of camera trap, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a range of traps that uh, I've trialled or have had recommended to me. Um, but it comes down to a number of features and uh, there's several different price brackets for these, uh, which I'll mention in a moment. How quickly the batteries are used up, the field of view of images, the range of the traps, so how far away will it trigger, and how quickly will the camera trap trigger. Um, but like I say, some of the fancier models can get around that by uh, constantly recording footage and having it ready, but uh, only saving it when it's required. And finally, the overall quality of the footage. So um, some of the newer models have, have really good quality cameras in now, and the technology just keeps carrying, uh, improving rapidly. So as well as the camera trap, you will need some accessories. Um, most take uh, eight AA batteries and I re recommend the rechargeable ones. Um, a new set of batteries does last quite a long time, um, potentially a few months, um, but um, when it comes around to put it out again, I think it's uh, uh, more environmentally friendly to have rechargeables. They will need a charger um, and also uh, you'll need a memory card and Majority of camera traps take up to 32 gigabyte memory cards in SD formats. It's a very common format now. And most camera traps will come with straps to attach them to trees or posts. Um, but also a um, lot have a foot on them that can attach to tripods as well. So that offers you a range of um, methods to attach them. Here's a, a little table I put together showing um, some of the price brackets and a few recommendations of different models. Um, I'm not being paid commission by any of these companies, so it's just a few of, of, of my uh, uh, recommendations from personal experience. In the budget bracket, you've got the little acorn, uh, the 5210A model, it gets um, good photos, it's really small and um, just about gets HD video actually as well. So for its size and its price, this is a good one. In the mid range, I'd recommend the Bushnell Nature View. Um, these have a good range on them for recording mammals at a distance. Um, good photo quality again, um, although the video quality is uh, slightly lacking. So this is perhaps a better camera for, for stills. Also the mid-range, I've mentioned Browning trail cams. Um, the reason I've not suggested any models uh, here is that there's a huge range of models, not only from Browning, but across the spectrum in this middle price range of 100 to 200 pounds. This is kind of where the majority of trail cameras uh, lie in terms of price. And then at the high end, you can end up spending an awful lot of money um, on a trail cam and it improves the quality of footage you get, um, how well constructed the cameras are, so they probably last a long time. And in this bracket, you've got the Bushnell core range, uh, which gets 30 megapixel photos. So, um, you know, as good as top end uh, digital SLR cameras even, and triggers very fast indeed. So here's a picture of the little acorn, as you can see in, uh, in someone's hand, it's really tiny, this makes it um, useful for um, deploying in maybe more public settings where um, you want the camera trap to remain unnoticed. Uh, the Bushnell Nature View, this is a um, camera I've used a lot. Um, I should add at this point that um, 
my project uh, was fortunate to get a couple of these cameras thanks to Cofnod and their uh, biological uh, recording grants program. So in return for these cameras, I've submitted lots of records from around the uh, areas I work. Um, and there's the Bushnell core. Um, it's got this added um, uh, cover on it to help it blend in, um, camouflage and range of sensors, but uh, it comes at a very high price. So setting camera traps, um, you need to clear the memory card first, recommend formatting it, um, insert your fully charged batteries, um, and then you can turn it on to quickly test it. But uh, the, the nature views here, as you can see in the image, have a, um, a setting for setup mode, and that's when you use the, the inbuilt screen and the uh, menu system to fine tune your settings. You can set the date and time and that will often be stamped on the images, uh, which is handy for recording purposes. Uh, you can set the mode, do you want it on video or photo mode? And if you set it on video, you can set the length of recording. So you can set it in sort of 10 second bursts or uh, longer than that, depending on what you're trying to capture. And you can also change the quality. The only downside to setting high quality is it will fill up your memory card faster. So on-site placement of camera traps this is uh, really important for successful deployment. Putting a bit of time and effort in and um, thinking about uh, the thing you're trying to capture, how will they behave in the environment? If it's um, a mammal, they'll probably tend to move along corridors. Um, trying to capture bats, it may be located at a roost size or something like that. So uh, where you put the camera trap determines what you will get. Um, to improve your chances of successfully recording things, um, we occasionally use bait uh, and I'll go on to talk about that in a moment. But it's important to secure your camera trap well and quite firmly. Um, if your camera trap's shaking, it's going to trigger all the time and waste uh, footage and battery life. So um, the straps that get sent with the traps is uh, good to have them really firm or if it's on a tripod make sure that's out of a windy location and um, somewhere it's not going to blow over. So for a few different locations I've suggested uh, potential sort of target species and then the bait you, you can use to help attract that. So if you're in a river or stream location and you're hoping to uh, collect footage of water voles, I found apple juice or even slices of apple work well. Um, you, may, you might get a situation where water vole comes in and it's looking around for the apple if you've got apple juice but um, and it can't find any. Um, so apples may be uh, uh, a nicer thing to offer. Uh, for otter, um, you know, they don't tend to be too fussy. If they're in the area, there's a good chance of camera trap will um, uh, get footage. But if you want uh, to really encourage them in, uh, sardines might be a good way to, uh, to do that. And then in woodlands or gardens, so, um, you know, most people have a garden. And in North Wales, there's good, good badger populations. So there's a chance you might get badgers in your garden. I know they dig up the lawns, but it's worth having for the, for the uh, honour and prestige. Um, but if you want to track them in, um, you're best off using something like peanut butter. And then for garden birds, you can put uh, camera traps at feeders. Of course, that's more of a diurnal thing. Um, but as, as the photo showed earlier in the talk, uh, we captured a barn owl uh, by having a, a trap by a feeder. So you can get some interesting uh, sightings. And then near the ground, again, for hedgehogs, similar to badgers, uh, but wet cat or dog food uh, works well and is popular with the hedgehogs. I've also put in here a heathland uh, spot, a basking spot for adders. You don't need to bait those. Those tend to be sort of traditional basking sites. So um, if you find a nice open patch, a uh, small open patch within heathland on a sunny exposed slope, um, there's a chance you'll get adders. Um, probably in the next couple of months, really, coming out of hibernation. Um, so just to show you uh, actually baiting a site, this is a river, a little stream on Anglesey. Uh, we had camera traps up last year, oh no, two years ago now. 
and we we put down apple juice. Um, the camera was put up first, so it actually captured the moment we put down the apple juice for the watercolors. And here's a picture of a sort of um, open uh, rolling landscape that we get in parts of North Wales. And I'm just trying to think here, where would you put a, a camera trap here if you were looking to record mammals and things, or terrestrial mammals in particular? Um, and I would suggest, you know, at the edge of the field here is where you've got the best chance. You've already got a, a route that might be being used by mammals. If you just put the camera trap out in the middle of the field, low down, you're just going to capture uh, vegetation. Uh, maybe you might get a field vol or something. But uh, along the edge of the field would probably be best. Um, and in this setting, there's not many trees, so you might have to put in a post or a pole or something to attach your camera trap to. And then when your camera trap's been out for um, a number of weeks or even months, um, it's time to collect them in. Um, you turn the setting uh, to off on the trap and then remove the SD card. And then the, the real fun begins where you get to go through your images. Um, I think there is some software out there now that can go through uh, footage or images and um, sort of take out the images that, uh, where, where motion uh, has been detected rather than sort of false positives where you do get where nothing seems to be in the image. Um, that's partially, that partially down to the location you've chosen, but also the sensitivity um, of the sensor, which you can change in the settings. Um, but generally, you will have to go through the images manually, and it is quite a fun process. Um, and uh, if you're going to collect footage of uh, wildlife uh, this way, it's good to record the species, times and dates so that you can upload to the Covnod database. I thought I'd give a little plug there, uh, Richard. But um, yeah, going through the footage takes a while and um, there's some highs, but there's also a lot of uh, sort of going through images where not much happens. But it's important to not stare at the uh, images for too long or else you might end up looking like the robot here from uh, off of the telly. Some uh, issues with camera traps I thought I'd let you know about. Um, it can take a while to perfect the settings, so maybe don't deploy a camera trap straight away if you've just got one for a few months because you might get it in and then you've got nothing usable. Um, put it out for a few nights, see how that goes, take it in, have a look, and maybe uh, just change the settings. Here's an image you can see on the right where the sensor was set too high, so um, and I think the vegetation was too close, so it's overexposed the image. And um, uh, you get this sort of blown image. Um, there is actually a fox there on the left-hand side, so it was still useful for a record, uh, but not a particularly attractive image. Um, sometimes cameras can become a bit fogged up with uh, condensation. Um, there's not a lot you can do about that other than maybe where you place it. Um, uh, if it becomes a repeated problem, they may need um, looking at and uh, checking over uh, to see if there's a sort of gap in the housing that's le letting in moisture. Um, weather, so wi high wind or rain can reduce detections um, and uh, that is all down to the placement really. If you can keep it in a sheltered location, you're, you're most likely to uh, reduce the number of sort of false positives or things like uh, grass moving. And then as I touched upon security, um, if it's in a public place you want to keep it kind of out of the way. Although they come in colours like green and browns, they, they are, are a bit noticeable if they're near public rights of way. So um, for the sake of not having your camera trap stolen, I would um, move, it, move it off a, a track. Um, but if it's on private land, if it's your own land, that's absolutely fine. But if it's the land of someone else, always get the permission of the landowner. And if you're looking to take uh, footage of certain species, you may need a license. For example, uh, rare birds might require a Schedule 1 license to use. And it's worth me adding that all the pictures in this talk where we've, we've had them with uh, Schedule 1 breeding birds were taken under license. 
Uh, so using the camera traps around the Anglesey Fens, this is why I originally got uh, a couple of traps from uh, Covnod uh, to record the, uh, particularly the mammals around the Anglesey Fens a couple of years ago. Here's a few examples that I'll just rattle through. Um, so there's a hedgehog. I've, I've cropped this image, it was a little bit distant, but um, this was coming in quite regularly eventually to, um, to dog food, I think. And uh, the, owner, the landowner was really pleased to confirm he had hedgehogs on his land. Uh, but whilst they were set at this site, it also recorded um, a bat species, probably a pipistrel, but uh, not, it's perhaps not the best monitoring tool for bats. People, of course, as, as Dan mentioned, um, uh, these uh, echo locators, so uh, the specialist equipment, audio recording equipment for that. Um, but just happened to catch that uh, that bat. And you can't have a camera trap up on Anglesey without recording red squirrels almost by accident. Pretty much every project site I had the, the cameras out on uh, had red squirrels. So it was really nice to see and uh, kind of cuteness overload there. Um, but then we also got some uh, less expected species. So this was a water rail at that same site previously where we'd hoped to catch water voles. Um, and then, um, thanks to this sighting of the water water rail, um, a type of crake, uh, we uh, searched the nearby marsh it was placed at and managed to confirm water rail breeding there, which was a new breeding site. So it led to a really interesting record there. And you get some accidental shots. This is a, a juvenile swallow hawking over a meadow. Um, we'd put this camera trap out ho hoping for large mammals, but um, uh, you, you get some sort of bycatch in a way, you get things like this one. And then I'm going to show you a few examples from around the rest of North Wales, um, thanks to um, some of my colleagues for these images. Um, so this is a badger that was captured um, last year at Gwaith Powder um, by Rob. Um, so it's foraging uh, out in the edge of a meadow here. And then a really exciting find, this was a polecat near Mould uh, by Johnny. And he's lucky enough to have polecats uh, regularly on his land, he tells me. So I'm uh, a wee bit envious of that. And then where I work now on the Wrexham Industrial Estate, um, camera traps have recorded otters on a number of occasions uh, using the Red Wither Brook that flows through the estate there. It's a very uh, unpromising section of uh, stream, but um, it, the otters uh, occasionally use it for fishing and uh, really nice to see them in such an urban area in North Wales. And then um, one more image from uh, the Little Turn project I used to work at. These images are taken under licence, but um, trail cameras were a handy way to monitor uh, the nesting attempts of the Little Turns. Um, but they can show you so much more and some of the footage that was collected has gone on to be used uh, by students from Bangor University for their research projects. Uh, but we also use them to detect um, the uh, colouring combinations of some of the birds that have been ringed in the past um, uh, alongside uh, using GoPro cameras which record in even higher quality. So um, that's a, a quick run through of uh, camera traps and everything about them. Um, if you've got any more information, um, please feel free to send questions in the chat now or email me after this event and I'll be happy to answer them. And we've got more information on our website at northwaleswildlifetrust.org.uk. But uh, yeah, thanks to uh, Danny at Dark Skies Wales for also being on this event and uh, Richard at Coffin for inviting me and uh, my colleagues at the Wildlife Trust. So thank you very much.